one of the things that we expect to get out of a, say, a 30-day boot camp or a 30-day challenge is, well, by the time I get to the end of this 30 days, I'll have this new habit. I will have acquired this habit of daily exercise or, or I'll have stopped eating sugar and then it'll be a habit. And so it'll just stay forever. And I don't see that working out the way we hope that it will with those challenges. I think that there's more to creating a lasting habit than simply repeating a behavior for a magical number of days. Hello, and welcome to the Bold Life Podcast. Today, we're joined by Monica Reinagel to talk about why we love challenges and boot camps, but they don't always lead to lasting change when it comes to our habits. Monica is a licensed nutritionist, author, coach, and speaker. In her Nutrition Diva podcast, now in its 13th year, she focuses on the science of food and nutrition. And in the Change Academy podcast, Monica and her co-host, movement and fitness expert Brock Armstrong, delve into the art and science of behavior change. Welcome, Monica. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, I'm delighted to be here today, Nicole. This is a topic that I am super interested in, and I can't wait to get your perspective on this. But first, can you tell us a little bit more about you and kind of what got you interested in working in this area? Well, you know, it's been an evolution. I've been working in the field for a couple of decades, and I never could have anticipated landing here from from where I started out. But my training is in nutrition. And I guess my original idea was that in being able to give better information about nutrition and food, that that would empower people to make better choices and, and live healthier lives. And the longer I worked with people, the more people I worked with, I started to see that it wasn't really, the information was not the primary problem. Or if it was a problem, like not knowing what to eat or how to eat, that was relatively quickly solved. <laughs> what turned out to be a bigger challenge for most of the people that I was coming into contact with is how to get themselves to do what they meant to do, what they want to do, what they know would be in their best interest. That seems to be a much bigger challenge than just figuring out what to eat for breakfast. And so my interests and my practice and my focus focus have kind of evolved to focus more and more on that question about what motivates us to do the things that we do. How can we motivate ourselves? How can we create lasting behavior change? Um, and, and, and I feel like that gives me much better tools to help people create the, create the outcomes that they're trying to create than just being able to tell them, you know, how much protein they need or whether or not they're getting enough vitamin C or whatever. Yeah, that's super interesting. I'm glad you brought this up because I I talked about this a little bit on the show before, but many, many years ago, back when I was a student, I did a rotation in a diabetes clinic. And I found the same thing is that folks know what they need to do, right? Like everyone knows what we're supposed to do to take care of our bodies and our minds, but kind of following through and staying on track with that doesn't always line up, right? That information is out there, like you said, but we're not really putting it into play. Yeah. And I think it sets up a real interesting relationship with ourselves. We almost are in battle with ourselves or at war with ourselves because on the one hand, we want to be healthy. We want to make good choices. We see ourselves not making those choices and we don't understand what the disconnect is. Why do I, why do, I do these things that I know are undermining my own goals? It's a very interesting question. Yeah, that is a super interesting question. Well, let's start with challenges and boot camps because I do want to get your perspective on those. I personally love a good challenge. I set up challenges in some of the work that I do. I like participating in them. And I know they can be a really great way for me at least to kind of boost my motivation and get started. But what do you think some of the problems are when it comes to those challenges and boot camps? Well, first, let me say that I think you're right. It can be a really good way to get motivated to get started. There's a lot of new getting started energy that goes into those, those programs, and we get really excited about doing something new. And I think often those sorts of challenges are done in a group setting, and it's always more fun to do something with a group. You get the kind of camaraderie, and you feel like, okay, there are going to be people here kind of holding me in harness because we're in it together. So I think those are some of the things that attract us to challenges. But I, 
in my experience, they rarely seem to lead to the kinds of lasting behavior change that I think we hope they will. And I think there may be a few different things. One, we have this idea that we've heard a million times that it takes 21 days to create a habit. And so maybe one of the things that we expect to get out of a, say, a 30-day boot camp or a 30-day challenge is, well, by the time I get to the end of this 30 days, I'll have this new habit. I will have acquired this habit of daily exercise or or I'll have stopped eating sugar and then it'll be a habit and so it'll just stay forever. And I don't see that working out the way we hope that it will with those challenges. I think that there's more to creating a lasting habit than simply repeating a behavior for a magical number of days. I think there's more involved there. And that often is not addressed in that boot camp or in that challenge. Um, It's just about getting to the end of the challenge in one piece, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know one of the things you mentioned there that I'd be interested in your perspective on it, it sounds like you know, some of that initial motivation, as you said, comes from having that accountability. So you're you're showing up every day to this boot camp, you have people to cheer you on, and then you kind of go back to your own life and you're missing that, all that support and really that context for your brain is what it comes down to. We know our brains learn better and remember information when we always do it in the same place. So if we study for an exam in the same room that we're going to write the exam in, we remember better. Do you think part of that is we leave that challenge and then just some of that momentum kind of goes with us and we go back to our normal lives. Is that part of the problem? That may be part of it, but I think that we can use that information to maybe get more out of challenges and and use that time more effectively um, by thinking as we're going through the challenge, what will this look like beyond on day 31? How do I start to translate some of these changes that I'm making or start to um, incorporate some of the structure or whatever it is that's making this challenge kind of fun and doable for me, whether it's the accountability, whether it's the uh, clear um, object, uh, clear marker for whether or not you succeeded for the day. Sometimes it's just like that real concrete, you know, I did it. How, but to start thinking during that challenge, how, what does this look like at, after the challenge is over? How do I keep, how do I build this into my daily life? starting day 31, so that you don't get to the end, you have a big celebration, you do the happy dance, and then it's like it never happened. The next day, the challenge is over, and you're kind of back at square one. I think part of this is that creating lasting behavior change, some of that is about changing our identity. There's some identity change, I think, that accompanies a a true behavior change. Yeah, sorry, I was going to ask, can you tell me a little bit more about that? What do you mean by identity change? I think that in order to make lasting changes in our behavior, there's a degree to which we we start to think of ourselves in a different way as someone who does that. You know, right. not someone who's just participating in this challenge, but someone who exercises every day or someone who eats healthy or whatever the focus of the challenge is. And that identity has to be strong enough and internalized enough that it also gets you through the day when you don't do it, that it doesn't rattle your identity. Okay. Today I didn't, um, eat the way that I wanted to, or I didn't make my workout, but I'm still somebody who does that. That's still part of my identity. Therefore tomorrow I will do it. You know, I think another way that these challenges may undermine lasting changes that there's a certain kind of absolutism built into them. You know, it's, Mm. you're either all in or you failed in the challenge and it doesn't maybe, um, start to build the kind of flexibility that we need in real life to make those lasting changes because we're going to have to be able to absorb like, oh yeah, it didn't happen today, but that doesn't mean that I've failed to be someone who does this. That doesn't mean that it's over now. Um, it just means today was today and, uh, and tomorrow is tomorrow. So do does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking here. I have my thinking face on. Sorry, I know everyone at home can't see my face, but apparently I have this like thinking face that makes me look confused <laughs> or like I don't agree. And people say they hate to present in front of me because I have this like thought face because I'm thinking about all this because I, like I said, I run challenges and I'm thinking about how I might implement some of these strategies kind of in my own life, either when I take on a challenge myself or when I do a challenge and thinking about, like you said, you know, how am I going to put this into my life after? 
the challenge? How am I going to incorporate this into my life? And then that concept of identity too, this is for everyone listening, this is something I just learned about over the past year as well, about how important identity is to behavior change. And I've been working in behavior change for like a gazillion years at this point. So this is new to all of you. That's okay. It was new to me too. But I really like that idea that you mentioned of tying our habits and our behavior to who we are. Because if I am a person who exercises regularly, that's a lot easier for my brain than to get that motivation to go for a walk because I'm a person who does these things. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, let me give you a concrete example that just came up for us this week in our, so I run with Brock Armstrong. He's my co-host in the Change Academy podcast. We run a coaching program together that is for people who are working on weight loss. Brock is a fitness uh, expert. I do nutrition, but we're both deeply, deeply interested in behavior change. And one of the things that we say is that we don't want to teach people how to lose weight. We want to teach people how to weigh less. And that's that identity piece, you know? So one of our members was reflecting this week that he's in the process of losing weight right now. And so he feels very motivated because he's, a, he's working his way towards a goal and he doesn't know how he'll stay motivated once he's reached that goal because he will have achieved it. And so the group was kind of chewing this over and, and sharing some thoughts. And what it came down to is the shift between doing something in order, uh, practicing a behavior, whether it's exercise or eating or whatever it is, in order to lose weight, which is has an end point. It kind of implies, right, and once I reach my goal weight, I'm done, you know, as opposed to doing this thing because I am someone who weighs less which doesn't have an endpoint. It's on, it goes on. It's achieved every single day that you act in that way, that you live your life as someone, you know, with those behaviors that allow you to weigh less. Uh, and so it's, but we have, we are, I think as a society, very focused on goals and endpoints and achievements. And all of those, when you think about them, have a sort of finish line built in. And what we really need to do is figure out how to remove the finish line so that our new habits, our motivation, you know, are carried through into an ongoing state as opposed to a, you know, an end point, a goal that we achieve and then we're done. I love that. I love that. It makes me think of what we used to talk about, about having kind of um, intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. And so that mm -hmm. kind of goal based, you know, I want to look a certain way or be a certain weight or run this marathon or whatever it is, it's often an extrinsic, which means it's outside of ourselves, right? We have this set thing. But if we bring that goal or that behavior change as part of our identity, it becomes part of who we are, which is more internal, which is greater um, long-term change for us. Is that right? Yeah. In the Change Academy, we have like a sort of vocabulary that we've developed and we sort of distinguish between a goal, which might be to run a marathon, you know, and an objective, which is to be someone who lives an active lifestyle. And we don't want to throw goals completely under the bus. Like it's fun to have goals and they can help us achieve new um skills or new, you know, accomplish things. So it's not that goals are bad. It's just that we want to connect those goals to a larger objective that continues even after that goal has been reached. So goals can be great interim things to kind of break up the journey, you know, and allow us those little celebrations for when we do accomplish something or reach a, a benchmark or a milestone. But we always want to have that larger objective, as you said earlier, as the context for that goal. It's one of the reasons this goal is worth working on to me is because my objective is to be somebody who prioritizes fitness or be someone who prioritizes a healthy lifestyle. Um, and, and I think that's how they can work together. I want to go back a little bit, if you don't mind. You mentioned the person in your program who had this goal and was kind of worried about kind of what happens next. And I know I've shared on the show before, I found myself in that place a few years ago. I went to school for like a gazillion years and I graduated and I got my dream job. And then a few years later, I was feeling not great about it, right? Like I mm. loved my job. It was super great. It was what my dream had always been. And that's exactly after some time to do some self-reflection. What I found is that I had reached this goal and I didn't have anywhere else to go, right? I got my dream yeah. job. I was happy, but I wasn't happy. Is that the kind of kind of stuck feeling you're talking about there? That's a really interesting story. I'm reminded of um, 
these young Olympic athletes who win gold medals at age 16, 17, whatever, 20, and sometimes they will describe going into profound depression afterwards. Because imagine what it must take, especially as a young person, as an adolescent, to marshal the kind of focus and intensity and, and sustained effort that it would take to win a gold medal at the Olympics, right? Like that's a pretty extraordinary achievement. And they're standing up there on the podium receiving their medals. And there's this horrible feeling like, and what's now what is my life about? Now what am I working towards? Now what's going to give me that sense of satisfaction? They can feel really lost, you know, after that. Maybe that's an even more extreme example of what you're describing. And a way, again, that I sometimes see this come up in the groups that we work with is that people are really doing well, are really succeeding at the goal that they had set for themselves. And, and they start to panic, you know, um, there's almost like a little fear of reaching the goal, fear of success. And I think it, it can be different things for different people. Sometimes what it is, is wow, if I, especially because a lot of these folks, this has been an unmet goal for years, for decades, you know, a big part of their identity as adults has been around having this one problem that they can't solve or that won't stay solved. So as they start to feel like they're moving towards a place where this is no longer going to be an issue for them, there can be a little bit of a, of a panic. And maybe some of it is like, oh gosh, if what will, what will be expected of me now? You know, if I reach this, then, you know, what goal or, or, accomplishment have I been deferring because this thing is still in front of me? And once this thing is, is solved, then what's my excuse? You know, what's going to, um, what, what will be standing between me and that? So I think there can be a lot of different things, but it's something I think we can all watch out for if we are goal oriented and we're making progress towards the goal as exciting as that is, um, that sense of, uh, apprehension about what will happen after the goal and that that can sometimes cause us to undermine our own progress because then we can kind of delay that that moment a little bit longer if we if we kind of slip up a little bit. Oh, super interesting. So almost that we end up procrastinating just to avoid that uncertainty, right? Yeah. Of what those expectations might be. Or that next step that, you know, or or that who will I be? You know, when you were working on your doctorate, you were a doctoral student. I'm sure that was a huge part of your identity. Well, who will I be when I'm no longer a doctoral student? No, I'm, you know, just a doctor. And what is my, you know, what is my definition? But there, there's one other aspect of challenges that I think might be fun to talk about. One of the other things that attracts us to them, but I think is probably one of their dark sides. And that is our attraction to this clean slate you know, because there's a sense of when we start a new challenge or we start a new 30 day, whatever boot camp cleanse detox, you know, that we're going to just leave everything that came before behind. And we're going to kind of step into this fresh new start and we're going to wipe the slate clean and we're going to start there. Does that sound familiar in any way? And I think one of the reasons we end up signing up for these boot camps or these challenges is that we feel like things have been going badly and we have to do something dramatic. You know, we've just been really not taking care of ourselves. Things have really slipped. We need to do something dramatic to get our attention. And in taking that first step, we can kind of clear uh, <laughs> clear what came before out of our history. Right? I think that's a powerful attraction to these sorts of things. And there's an opportunity I think we miss when we do that, when we pretend that by starting a new project or a new challenge or a new diet or whatever, that nothing that came before still exists, you know, that we're not carrying any of that past or history into our present. It was just hard stop. We start from here. And that is that we, we don't take the opportunity to understand, well, what, what got us to this point where things felt so out of control? What were the, the factors or the circumstances or the choices that led us to a place where we felt so poorly about what was going on in our lives? If we don't ever look at that, if we just think, okay, that doesn't matter. I'm going to start fresh with this brand new shiny program, and then it'll be perfect from here on out. That'll take us until we have the first little bump in the road. 
And then we haven't learned anything, you know, from those prior bumps in the road that can help us negotiate that because we, we just flush them. We kind of just pretend that they don't exist. You know, nothing before day one counts. Um, and, and therefore, they're not there for us to learn from. So I think it's that concept of being able to, before we just quickly turn away from something that feels like a failure or a lapse, if we can spend a little time and be compassionate and be curious about what happened there, it will give us so many more resources to draw from in the future when inevitably our shiny new thing gets a little tarnished or a little, you know, bumped or bruised. Right. That's super interesting to me. We talk a lot in this on this show about how kind of our brain's defaults happen and how we get back into those old habits so quickly sometimes, right? You're basically your brain has these default settings, these habits, these routines that it wants to get back into. And just like you're saying, if we're just trying to start from a clean slate and ignore all of that, when times get tough, when we get to those obstacles, that's going to be the default for our brains, right? We're just going to slip back into those old habits because that's what your brain knows that's what's easiest for us and not learning or not giving ourselves that opportunity to learn from those past experiences means that we're not actually changing those you know deep set defaults right and what you just said raises a, a perfect example of how we could make better use of a challenge and that would be when you're doing it you can be instead of just thinking like okay what's it going to take for me to get 30 days to do this for 30 days you can be thinking what would it take to make this my new default? What changes might I need to make in my environment, in my schedule, in my social uh, circle, in my mindset, you know, in my closet? I mean, in my daytime or like, what would I need to do to not just get to day 30, but how could I make this my new default? And that could be a great way to use that time to not only check that box. Yep. Did it for 30 days in a row, but also use that as an opportunity to create a new groove that, that you can, if that's something that you want to continue in the future. Yeah. It really sounds like when it comes to those challenges and those bursts of motivation and whenever we're putting a lot of intense effort into something, thinking about really the long game is important of how am I going to put this into play in my life after this? What am I going to do to keep this going so that I don't just get to that 30 days? Yay. Fantastic. I did great. And then two months later, I'm back where I was before or sometimes worse because sometimes we end up worse. Is that right? Yeah. That sort of compensatory backlash. And another good question that you could ask when you're in that flush of enthusiasm with a new challenge is, what would the imperfect version of this look like? Because, you know, there is that kind of all or nothing thing that we get into a challenge, you know, I'm going to just, I'm going to do this 100% because that's kind of what constitutes success. But of course, that's not sustainable. So wouldn't it be fun to think, okay, what's, this is great. And this is going to be my 30 day, you know, um, gold star here. What would the B minus version of this look like in my life? And, and start to picture that because that's probably the version that you actually could sustain. And that would be good enough to get you to some of your ultimate objectives and goals. We don't have to live A plus lives, you know? I feel like if we can live B lives, we are beating the average. We're above average. Right. And that is, I got to tell you, that is really hard for this community. This community is full of, on this podcast, is full of recovering perfectionists and overachievers. And it is really hard for us to say, I'm not going to give A plus effort all the time. Do you have any strategies or tips to kind of get to that point where we're okay with that? <laughs> so I'm thinking that this is a community that should really think twice about those challenges because they do play into that perfectionism and that absolutism and that. So now I'm already thinking, how can I design a challenge for this group where the challenge would be to put in a B effort every day for 30, <laughs> for 30 days you know, and have that feel motivating enough and to be able to see the benefits of it and to be able to, um, to enjoy the accomplishment of that. Uh, but yeah, I hear you. I'm definitely in that camp myself. I feel like every insight I've ever come across that, that I've used to help other people is something that I learned because I did it <laughs> because, because it was, it was a trap that I fell into. That was something that was getting in my way. So, um, so yes, I, 
I know what that means. But I think even just articulating these things is really helpful. Even just being able to step back and understand just the way we are. What is it about that is so appealing about those 30 day things? And how is that playing into my tendency to overachieve or to be all or nothing, to be a perfectionist? And, and even that insight can help us use a challenge more, more effectively. That's great. And for everyone listening, this is something that I I know I've shared in this group, but I am working on this as well. And my current mantra that I have a little sign on my wall, it says done is better than perfect. And one of the things that I try to keep in mind is that, you know, I can't save the world if I'm giving a plus effort to everything because I only have so many resources, right? And so what is enough for me to reach that goals? And it doesn't have to be that a plus 150% all the time because all that's going to do is burn me out. Right. And and if A plus is the goal all the time, then everything less than A plus, including A and A minus, somehow feels like a failure, you know? And that's a lot of load and pressure to put on ourselves that I don't think increases our effectiveness in the world. Um, so sometimes we want to be able to extend to ourselves the same grace that we are so ready to offer to one another. And uh, and not just lip service to it, but really you know? Yeah, that's fantastic. So what I'm kind of taking away from this is when it comes to challenge, they're great. They can definitely help our motivation. They can help us get that burst of energy, but keeping in mind, you know, what are our long-term goals and making sure we're not falling into some of those traps of, you mentioned approaching them as a blank slate and forgetting about everything that's happened before us, going in with that absolute mentality of I will be 100% perfect and nail this, or if I'm not, I'm just going to give up and quit. And how am I going to carry this forward in my life? What are those small changes that I can make based on the information that I've learned? Right. I, I couldn't have summed that up better. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm taking notes because I think, like I said, this is these are things that we do in this group and I'm always looking for ways to be better at the change that we're doing and stay on track with those goals. So thank you so much for sharing all this. Okay. Two more questions. Final, second, last one. This is a new one I'm asking everyone. If I was your best friend, what book would you recommend I read? It can be fiction or nonfiction. Oh, that is always tricky to recommend books to people that you don't know very well or read because, because what we love to read is so, um, so personal and so individual. But um, during COVID, I actually joined a book club for the first time uh, and it was wonderful. I read about, we read about 15 books together with this group of women, some of which I loved, some of which I didn't. And it's just been really fun. So I actually have a big catalog right now of <laughs> books to recommend. And one of the ones that I enjoyed most over the last little while was Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller, who you may recognize her name from NPR. She's been on a lot of them. She was an NPR re reporter and now she has a, a, a popular um, syndicated show, but it's a wonderful book. That's part history, part science, part romance, um, great reportage, lots of fun. I learned a lot. I always appreciate books that um, fill in gaps in my education <laughs> uh, and it was fun. So it uh, may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I sure enjoyed it. Fantastic. I wrote that down. I'll put that link in the show notes as well so folks can find it. Okay. Final question. If anyone listening wants to learn more about you, they want to follow you, where's the best place to go? Well, given what we've talked about today, I think if people are interested in, in more of this kind of exploration, the best place would be to check out the Change Academy podcast because we are all about the imperfect the perfection of the imperfect effort, you know, and uh, and what it takes to actually create sustainable changes. And we actually put together a little study guide to that. I can tell that your listeners are um, good students, so this will probably appeal to them. Um, we put together a little study guide uh, that we call the lab notebook that you can use to kind of work through the the podcast, specifically the eight things we believe are necessary to create sustainable change. Um, one of which is failure, by the way, you won't be surprised to hear. Anyway, you can download the, the notebook if you want to use it as a kind of um, guide to that work. And it's at changeacademypodcast.com slash notebook. Perfect. I'm writing that down. I'll put those links in the show notes as well so folks can find you more easily. Well, thank you again, Monica, for being on the show. This was fantastic. I know I learned so much. 
Well, I'm so grateful that we got to know each other a little bit better, and I'll look forward to continuing the conversation. All right, everyone, that's a wrap for today. I'm Dr. Nicole Byers, and you're listening to the Bold Life Podcast.